Um, having seen uh, Tom's and Margaret's presentations, um, it's really impressive to see just how much work is going on around Europe, around the world, to give us improved access to our audiovisual heritage, to, to the cultural heritage reflected in things other than texts and books, and also how much commonality of interest there is. Uh, and I think the move towards open licenses, open source, open standards, open platforms, open everything, uh, gives us an enormous opportunity to, to collaborate uh, more efficiently. I spent much of yesterday chairing a conference and was completely distracted by what was happening 300 million kilometers away uh, on Comet P67. Um, and frankly, if we can land a fridge-sized robot on a comet, we can certainly sort out the problems of digitizing our cultural heritage. <laughs> if we'd allowed one major European bank to go bust five years ago, we could have paid for it all as well. <laughs> so I work for the British Broadcasting Corporation, which was founded in 1922. Uh, not quite 100 years ago, as the British Broadcasting Company. It was then nationalised. And, and this man, John Reith, was the first Director General of the BBC. And he set its mission as being to inform, to educate and to entertain. And that did for most people when it was by and large a broadcaster. But I have spent the last four or five years adding the word engage at the end of that to point out that it is not enough just to tell people things, it is not enough to push things down, broadcast channels into them. You actually have to engage them in various ways, you have to stimulate their interest and in their activity. Really, the point is to get people to do things, not just to show them things. And that is actually implicit in the BBC's mission. This is the charter, the original 1926 charter, um, promulgated by the king at the time, George V, and it says down there that the corporation is for the public benefit, that it should exploit technology to the best advantage and in the national interest. Well, I'm going to interpret national interest as being public interest and be slightly broader than the imperial sentiment expressed there to say not just European but global interest that the BBC was brought into existence to make sure that as communications technologies developed, it served people. It was not used to exploit them. The BBC was put in place to be the anti-Facebook, to be something which respected people, to be something which gave them something back, to be something which would actually contribute to people's lives and would not do so at the cost of their privacy or their personal integrity or anything. And it has tried to do that by using the best available technology. Uh, and I say this because the core mission of the BBC, the things that the BBC is asked to do, are pulled together in these, the, the, the public purposes. And as a corporation incorporated by Royal Charter, you know, I can say that you know, the Queen of Britain says, Queen of the United Kingdom says, we have to do these things. And they're a really fascinating set of things because they give you permission to do an enormous amount that is not just making television programs. They actually give you permission to do very important things about stimulating creativity and cultural excellence. And whilst for the past 50 years the BBC has by and large made radio and television programs, just as Liam said earlier about Wikimedia, its mission is not to make radio and television programs. Its mission is to do these things and if radio and television programmes are the best way to do it, that's fine. But as new ways of doing th those things become possible, the BBC could and should do those things. And that means using technology to the best advantage. I say this because over the last 90 years, we've accumulated a whole load of stuff. The byproducts of being a broadcaster has given the BBC a really interesting and rich collection. And I sit within a bit of the BBC called Archive Development, and we are charged with getting the most out of that collection. If I'm feeling flippant, I'll say, it's the stuff we forgot to throw away. I don't say that to my colleagues in the Archive Department, but certainly the stuff from the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of stuff we just forgot to throw away. And 
because we've been around since 1922, there's quite a lot of it. And it's not just audiovisual assets. It's not just radio and television programmes. It's the detritus of making radio and television programmes. It is the letters and the scripts and the contracts. We have letters from famous authors offering permission for us to broadcast their works. I have a letter from Brian Jones, the singer with the Rolling Stones from 1962, asking if we'll play the music from his band on the radio. All of this is in the archive. Now, that letter, of course, because it was never published, will perpetually remain in copyright. So, you know, we have issues there. We'll come to those. But we have this stuff, and we could find ways of using it. There's quite a lot of it. This is sort of a rough estimate. But actually, there's also not that much of it. Because two and a half million items of film and video sounds a lot. There's probably about 600, 700,000 hours of, of video, of, of television. And that sounds really quite impressive until you realize that's about how much YouTube grows every week. That you know, YouTube is growing by the size of the BBC's entire archive every week or so. So whilst we have a modest data problem, we don't really have a big data problem. This is absolutely something which we could scale up to deal with if we chose to have it all digitally available. And there is an ongoing project within the BBC to spend a few million pounds on what's called the end-to-end -end digital project. Because whilst Dutch broadcasters may have moved fully to digital production back in 2006, many of the BBC's production systems still have at least a tape-based, if not an analogue, step within the process of going from inception through to broadcasting. So there are still issues about making the BBC a fully digital or fully digitised broadcaster. Lots of this is of interest to lots of people. But as ever with important cultural collections, we don't know in advance what's of interest to whom. I was born in the north of England in 1960. It may well be there is some news footage that captured my mum in the background in about 1964 pushing me in a pram. If I had a way of getting hand, my hands on that piece of news footage buried in the archive somewhere, it would be of enormous interest and personal value to me, but would probably not impress anyone else in this room. And that's fine, because I'd be happy to have my 30 frames, and you could have your 30 frames, and you could have your 30 frames, and you could have your 30 frames. There may be documents about our parents, grandparents, children, relatives, that we would want to have access to. And because we've been storing all of this reasonably well for quite a while, what we've assembled is an enormously important cultural collection, a piece of cultural heritage. The problem is, it is perceived by the BBC as material to be used to keep the BBC going and to make new programmes. So we heard from Tom about how the, the, the Dutch broadcasters use a modest amount of archive material. BBC programmes also use archive material from the BBC's own archive. They don't have to go outside to get it, but it does mean that particularly the audiovisual archive is maintained to serve that interest. And of course, that makes perfect sense. It is important that that material can be used by programme makers, whether inside or outside the BBC. But I think it's also important that it can be used by other people in other ways and that we need to deal with the problems of getting people access to the BBC's collection. And furthermore, the solutions to getting access to the BBC's collection are the solutions to getting access to everyone else's collection. The BBC as an institution has a history of believing it is special and different. Partly that's because it's special and different, but also it's because we like to believe we are even more special and different than we actually are. And so we act as if we are the only people who can do certain things and that our ideas are better than other people's. And this is not necessarily the case. And there are few things more delightful than telling a very senior executive within the BBC that the thing they've just thought of was done by another organisation many years ago and better. <laughs> because it gives them that sense of connection to the real world that can sometimes be lacking. Some of the archive, as I said, is valuable to all of us. Some is priceless to just, just a few. So these few pixels can be of immense personal value. But also in historical context, this is a, a frame 
from footage from a very important industrial dispute in the United Kingdom in the mid-1980s, the miners' strike. And the BBC at the time, obviously, was you know, spent sending news broadcasters out, reporting what was happening. The material that was broadcast was a very small sample of the, all the material that was captured. And there was some political controversy in the mid-80s at the time that the BBC, because the BBC's cameras were on the police side of picket lines or on the police side of, of, of violent incidents, didn't reflect properly a balanced view of what was actually was happening in that industrial dispute and what was happening when, as a, on occasion, it um, ended up in violent confrontation between the police and the striking miners. We therefore commissioned a research project through the University of Leeds, or rather we agreed to participate in a research project. It was commissioned by another organization, but we agreed to participate in it, which brought together the striking miners and the police and allowed them to review material that had not necessarily been broadcast and to share their understanding and to capture that as an important piece of academic research. And this just reflects some of the comments that were made at the time. Those sorts of research-based use of the archive are really important for a number of reasons. First, they demonstrate that there is, if you like, academic value to this material and that it can and should be exploited. They also, for my purposes, provide another use case. They provide a way of showing that the material in the archive is of value to more than just program makers and that therefore this should be considered as one of the things the BBC tries to do with its archive. What we want to do is to apply some of the principles that we've heard from other organisations, we've heard other organisations talking about already today, to the BBC's archive, and crucially to connect the BBC's archive to everyone else's. So to break down those barriers that currently exist and to ensure that people can make connections between the different archival collections, between the different cultural heritage collections. What we'd like to be able to do is enable someone to take a journey across all these different collections, to find material that is relevant, to use the principles of linked open data and the emerging models from the semantic web to make it possible not necessarily to break down the silos because each collection has its own unique value as a collection, but to allow those who want to to travel easily between them. I may go back to my comet metaphor, spinning from planet to planet, accumulating enough velocity so that you can eventually arrive at your destination and put your lander down on the chunk of knowledge that you were trying to acquire about the world with a harpoon, even one that doesn't work. All of the different institutions are facing similar problems about what to do. And we've tried to step back and, and look at it from, from the broadest perspective. So we said, what would it look like if we could take the publicly held cultural and heritage assets, if we could put them into one space where they were connected together, where they were searchable, where they were fully opened and accessible, where they were visible and usable, so that we could interact with them, engage with them, add additional material tag material yourself, add additional metadata, upload your own assets if you have something, if you have something which is relevant, make that part of that broader collection, contextualize and in, enhance the usefulness of the material that is available. So we call it the digital public space because we couldn't think of a better name for it. It is at the moment the least worst name we've come up with to describe something which encompasses all of the work that many, many organisations are doing, not just in the UK but elsewhere. We have innately a sense of what a public space is, about how we behave in public space. We do not yet have a good and satisfactory model for what a digital and online public space might look like, except, I think, an understanding that such a thing would be valuable because it would allow us to think differently about the way we access the material. It would allow us to think slightly differently about the way we catalogue it. It would allow us to put more emphasis on being open and accessible, on having compatible ontologies, on ensuring that our metadata schemas fit together in various ways. And also about going to each of our individual organisations and saying, by doing these things, by doing these technical things and these standards things, you can be part of something much bigger 
and there will be a multiplier effect that the benefit to all that come from being able to link together the collections will be enormous. And there will be a business case for it. There will be a way to do things. We don't necessarily know what it is. This is uh, the um, BBC's test card uh, done as a digital um, image to demonstrate what we can do. So what we've been doing about this is talking to as many different organisations as we can, some of them here in this room, like Europeana, like Building Gulet. We've been trying to make a vision a reality by ensuring that everybody starts to think in the same way about how collections are linked together. And crucially, by not trying to tell anybody how it should be done. The BBC as an organisation has a great habit of seeing partnership as something that is done to people, not with them. And as a result, it can be very hard sometimes to work with us. We tend to stomp on people. Archive development is trying to do it differently because the goal is something which is not just of benefit to the BBC, but of benefit to everyone. You want a world, you want an environment within which you can ask reasonable questions and expect to get reasonable answers, whether it's statues in Florence or music in Paris or more sophisticated and complex queries. Find the images of war that schoolchildren have described as sad. How could you answer that question? How would you go about answering that question? Even just asking it poses so many questions. Find me references to my grandmother. How does the system know it's your grandmother? Or this last one is an example from my colleague, Jake Berger. He wants to be able to answer this question. Okay? Angry letters and uplifting films that mention George Orwell held in the United Kingdom, created by a Norwegian between 1980 and 1999. He reckons if you could answer that question, in order to get to the answer to that question, you would probably have had to solve all the problems along the way that you will ever come up against. So your mission tonight in the museum is to figure out a structure that we could use to, to answer this question. As the BBC, we have some resource, so we have been doing some things. We've been trying to build models that would demonstrate what a digital public space might look like, but it is really, really hard. Rights are the probably most important thing. In fact, I've trademarked the phrase, rights are hard, because I use it so often. I think it's only reasonable that it belongs to me. But identity and provenance are hard things too. We come up against a whole load of issues, and, and these are issues that nobody in the room will be surprised by at all. They are the things you would expect. Together we can solve them though. We've already heard examples today about how we can make progress on rights, on digitization, on extracting usable metadata from video. All these great examples are out there, and we want to work with them. So we've built some prototypes. We've built a reference data model. We've published guides to data publication. These are all available, and I'm very happy to share links to them. We built an overarching data model that mashed together some catalogs from a number of public institutions into one place just to show you could do it, and that worked quite nicely. It was called Paragon. Again, happy to share that. We took 500 hours of previously undigitized film from Northern Ireland in the 1970s, made available to academics and, and teachers, and they are adding usable metadata to it. And we've discovered that if you ask an academic to tag something, they will never use one word where 30 will do, which is something of a problem if you want an ontology. And now we're working on something called the research and education space where we're trying to get around a lot of the rights issues by taking advantage of UK copyright exemptions about the use of broadcast material in schools and, and, and learning, something called the Education Resource Recordings Agency Act, which allows us to do some quite radical stuff with material that would otherwise be unavailable or unlicensable, like sports material and things like that, because it is available in schools. And with that, we are aiming to aggregate a whole range of open catalogues of online education resources, link those collections together, and then develop tools and apps and services on top of that that will be used in teaching and research. What we want to do fundamentally is to persuade the BBC to see itself as a cultural institution in the same way as many other cultural institutions represented here, and not just as a broadcaster. The BBC is a cultural institution, 
It just needs to take itself seriously as a cultural institution. We want to promote all the great work that other organisations are doing across Europe and indeed across the world in the way that they fit with the BBC's aspirations and mission. And we want to deliver the benefits of this approach to everybody. We have a, a mission to offer universal access. That's interpreted to mean universal access to television and radio and our online site. It should mean universal access to our catalogues, our metadata, our index collections and all those things as well. And I look forward to working with all of you and your friends as we pursue this over the next few years. Thank you.